Um, I had a dream about two or three months ago that I told a few people. And I was walking down a hallway just like this. <coughs> There's no windows or doors on either side. And I just kept walking and walking and walking. And I wasn't walking towards the light. That's a different dream. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to a point, and I turned left. And on my right, there was an office. And in that office was Norm Campbell. Norm Campbell was my boss when I was a recreation programmer in 1989. I could see Carmen laughing, because Carmen worked for the city of Moose Jaw. <laughs> and I was surprised, because this is 2019. I was there in 1989, and I just said, so, so Norm, where you been? And he started telling me about a conference, a recreation conference he'd been at. And I was listening to him, and I looked at the office next to him, and it was Gary Mackay. And Gary Mackay was Norm's boss, which meant he was the head of the department. And I looked at the two of them, and I went, oh my god, I still work for the city of Moose Jaw. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't that bad. It's just there had been no progression. I hadn't taken a leave, an unpaid leave, to go off to Arizona State to get a le leisure studies degree and had some public admin courses. After that, I came back. I lasted about another month the city of Moose Jaw, and I really enjoyed being and doing my master's. And so I gave it up. I gave up everything that came with it, all the health care and the, everything that the seniority bought, and I went off. And so I was a lecturer at Regina. We were talking about this, some of us today, about those courses that you teach when you're too dumb to know you shouldn't be teaching them. And so I taught anatomy, I taught orienteering, I taught advanced badminton, which I haven't done since high school, because that's the stuff you do when you're a lecturer and starting out. I, lasted, I stayed there for two years, and I really liked being on the other side of the desk, so to speak. And so I went off to Virginia Tech. And I graduated, <coughs> as the dean said, in uh, 1997. <laughs> and I was told not to come to University of Alberta because it was, quote, not recreation friendly. And I didn't listen to that, as you can see. And I'm not quite sure why I had been told that there was a, quote, contentious search the year before, although my colleague here, Elizabeth Halpenny, says there's no such thing as a contentious search. They're dynamic. All searches are dynamic. <laughs> it's like, OK, we'll go with dynamic from now on. So that might have been one of the reasons. But the other thing is, the early 90s were a pretty tough time in Alberta. And the BA in Recreation Administration that Tom talked about was on the blocks. And it was um, through a variety of things, ARPA, alumni, and a letter writing campaign that went through a, out in North America that pretty well saved the degree, I think. But it still got cut. And so I hate to say it, when I was coming here, I was sold by the search committee this was a great place to come. And I thank the members of the search committee because they were right. But always a little bit, you're looking over your shoulder when you've got this in your background. You're just kind of going, well, how safe are we? And that does play into being an academic in recreation here. And I'll come back to that, sadly. This is my job announcement, believe it or not. Last week, we're looking um, for some photos. And Janet, my wife, finds the job announcement, which for some reason we saved. And you can see here what it was. It was both the social sciences, that was part of it, but also recreation practice. I had to be able to do both, and I had the background as a recreation programmer. Look at those salaries. And luckily, I had two other job offers. And so they came in with $45,000. And I was, you know, you're a grad student, you're making four or $5,000, it seems like. It sounds pretty good. And so that's what I started with, $45,000. And I was happy to be here. I've always considered myself a 40-40-20. 40% research, 40% teaching, and 20% service. So I want to talk about those things and some of the things that I've done and maybe some of the things that have worked for me and some of the things that haven't too. Conceptually though, when I think about this, when I think about the recreation degree, I think of it, oh, sorry, it's dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Liz. There's a paper that came out, 1985, and it said, there should be a pulling apart, a separation Recreation administration, you go one way, and leisure studies, the social sciences, the sociocultural aspect, we go a, a different way. They don't fit together. And I've always struggled with that, and it could be because part of my background, again, is recreation administration. 
So I've always thought of it sort of more like this, where everything fits. This is what I do, the leisure theory, but it ties into the recreation program. I tell my undergrad students, if you don't understand the theory, you're not going to be a good program. You need the practice, the research practice, because you have to be able to evaluate the research, but you also have to be able to do it. Needs assessments, for example. And if this is what we think is something like truth, then this is what we hope for, what is and what ought to be. And so that's why it's important to have measure philosophy as well. And so that's what makes, to my mind, the pillars that form a degree in recreation. You have to have them all. So from a pedagogical perspective, um, early on I was exposed to uh, a form like this, which is hard to read, I know, but Ed Riddell, who's a professor at the University of Utah, used these. And so I've used these. So every time a student has to read a chapter, they have to fill out one of these forms. And nine out of 10 like it. They seem to gain from it. And the two key parts are at the top is, pick a quote you like or hate, but tell me why. Because it gets them engaged in the reading. And I hear some amazing things that come from them. I'm really amazed. I think we talk a lot about texting and other things decreasing literacy, but I've actually found that the students have gotten better. And the other part down here is the analytical, the questions that they want to ask about that chat. And I know I've got some grad students, they fill these out as well, and I tell my students, this is what I do. And these have worked really well for me. You can see at the bottom, reading materials make a valuable contribution. This is your student, US Arise. 4.0 on a five-point scale, 75th percentile. And when I've done this, my median has been 4.7, so it's somewhere up around the 90th or 95th scale. And I remember Wendy Rogers is at the back when she was here. She said, George, what are you doing? And it's like, I think it's this. The books are great, because I help write the books. But I think it's this. <laughs> so just something I'll point out that was worked really well for me. It's not my idea, but I've done it for 20 years with grad students and undergrads. And I think it gets them to read the book. And that's something that's hard to do sometimes. Cheating. Well, I gotta give it off, my hat's my hat off to Brian Nielsen, who taught me everything I know about cheating. <laughs> and students cheating. I that's what I meant, really. So he, for example, told me about multiple choice uh, multiple choice exams and having various versions of it and mixing things up. He was the one that told me about I'm not sure how many of you have done this. You're trying to do a class like this, and students are coming in. And so you alphabetize A, B, C, D, and all the rest of it. And it's a great way, because you mix them up. And if they have the same name, you know, Susie and John Smith, brother, sister, probably split them up. And it's worked great, except when the students come in, it's amazing how many don't know the alphabet. <laughs> Just wandering around, where is the X? Well, he's probably it. <laughs> And Brian always said, you know, students will come in and they'll say, where did I lose marks? And I learned this. He said, you don't lose marks. You start with zero. You gain marks. <laughs> and it's just a way of rethinking things, but it's worked really well. So if you've been in this faculty for any length of time or you knew Brian, you will have a Brian story. And I'm going to tell my Brian story and the way my slides are going. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Which Brian's story? Brian and I and Linda Thompson, who retired about 2005, used to play what's called cutthroat, racquetball, where you play two on one. And Brian is a very competitive guy, you may know this. So we're playing one day, him against Linda and I. He's three points down, or wins the point. He's two points down, wins the point. He's one point down, he wins the point, he says, I win and I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> True. <laughs> and so Linda goes, okay, I guess I'll go uh, wait around and you go get the car and that's what we did and we took him to the hospital where you work for a couple of days, right? And it just happened that the next day it was uh, faculty council and of course the discussion came up about Brian and his health and so um, something was done at faculty council 
Oh, this is us having veneers. This might have caused the heart attack. But that's different. <laughs> so this is what was sent out, and I'll just let you read it. <laughs> hey, it was better than I thought, right? <laughs> Brian never beat me at racquetball. <laughs> Third thing, I took a, a, a mental health workshop for dealing with students. And students sleep for all kinds of reasons. But the one that struck me here was when you learn about mental health, and sometimes this is the only place they feel safe. And so because of anxiety or depression or whatever, they don't sleep at home. They don't sleep at the library. They come here. And so it kind of refrained for me why I saw people sleeping at the back. And I was reading an article recently where they talked about, you know, if you see this as a professor, maybe you should ask how they're doing. Just don't assume that it's because you're boring. It could be that, <laughs> I'm told. But also think about maybe there's something else going on. And maybe that's a sign where you could provide a little bit of advice. So. Those are the three things in terms of <coughs> teaching. In terms of service, I sat on a lot of committees, I think. The faculty evaluation committee I sat on for a three-year term, and then I came in when Karen Fox was uh, on sabbatical, and I filled in for her. And one of the things I found out, well, you learn a lot in faculty counts, uh, faculty evaluation, about the breadth of this faculty. Tom talked about that, about how great people are doing and I sat on this, and as I said, I thought I did a lot of service until I sat on FEC the last time. I was like, geez, you're pretty average, Lord. You're putting in like 200 hours a year, but other people are putting in way more than that. So I'll say, if you have it, put your name for it for a faculty evaluation committee. It's amazing what you learn. It is just that important to do. A few ad hoc committees. Um, I was adding them up. 13 searches, some of which were successful, some of which weren't, but I believe if I look around, there's about six of you at least that was on your search committee. And I recommended you, I'll add that. <laughs> <laughs> but that was great, because you know, we used to say this is like a, a three quarter of a million dollar search committee, because you want to get the right person. And if they're gonna be here for four or five or six years, that's what it's gonna be. And you don't want them to be unsuccessful. So it matters. Another great committee to be on. Uh, the metrics committee trying to figure out how to measure stuff, like research. Uh, I was lucky to, to, Wendy Rogers started off looking at our faculty standards. We worked on that, and then John Spitz, over here, finished it off. And so that was great to see that come to completion. And I was on the multicultural strategies. I was the chair for that committee. And so this is the definition that they use for affirmative uh, equity employment. So non-Aboriginal because they have a historic and different contra contractual relationship with the Canadian government. And we know this came up because we know there is discrimination in employment. And these are the Statistics Canada data. So you can see what's happening here. This is 2016. So roughly 22% of the population of Canada is visible minority. In Edmonton, Toronto, Vancouver especially, but Edmonton and Calgary, it's even higher. About the time some of you are going to be doing this lecture, that's what it's gonna look like across the country. And you can see Edmonton's even higher. That's the projections. When our committee looked at this, one of the concerns was the university and maybe the faculty are not as diverse as it could be when it comes to visible minority groups. Uh, this was the last information. We don't have great data on this. This was incoming people when we looked at visible minority groups, but if this is reasonably accurate, we reflect somewhere around the 80s or 90s in our faculty. So, something to leave you with as I leave. There were a number of recommendations, and the great thing I like is I've seen those being put into place. And there was one here I wrote up and the committee approved about 
scholarships aimed specifically at international graduate students, and maybe because I was an international graduate student, this one made sense to me and hit hard at home. And so I went back home. And I said, Janet, I'm, I'm concerned I'm writing this stuff, but I'm, I'm not walking the talk. And she said, well, let's do something. And one of the reasons we stayed on here is to set up an international scholarship for students in the leisure area. Academic achievement, commitment to research in the areas of recreation, tourism, leisure studies, etc. And that was the first recipient three years ago, Jim Carroll Kona. Who was my grad student, but I wasn't on the committee, just want to make that clear. <laughs> he was deserving. And there have been a couple of others since, and they may be in this room, I believe they are, and I am just amazed when we go to the um, development sessions and we get a chance to see these people and hear their stories about coming to Canada and what they do and how excited they are to be here and the research they want to do. So, just something to think about. In terms of my research, I look at leisure behavior. I look at motivations for constraints to experiences during, Tom was talking about reading books, for example, and outcomes of leisure, especially quality of life related things. And one of the things, just to give you an idea, is I use self-determination theory, which is a psychological theory. And one of the things is there's these basic needs. If you remember Maslow? Yeah? Forget him. Okay? <laughs> Tell my students, you will never be on any exam. I, I give. It's the idea there's these three basic needs. Autonomy, which means you essentially buy into what you're doing. Competence is you feel capable of doing something. And you see Ryan called this relatedness. I like belonging because it gives me my ABCs and I can remember it. It's just you feel connected to somebody, you feel loved, you feel trust, and maybe it's even a, a bigger community. And so when I've done this, I'm really interested in, well, how it varies in terms of work and leisure. This was a study where we're looking at Edmontonians, about 400 people who worked here, talked about their leisure and work, and you can see some differences here in terms of how autonomous they feel in their leisure, how important belonging was in terms of being satisfied, and competence was less so in leisure, but that sort of makes sense because competence maybe more what you want in a job and what we look for in employees, where leisure competence is one aspect. Sometimes we don't want to feel confident. We just want to learn a new activity where we may feel incompetent. So that's part of it. But there's this part. And that's like looking at leisure behavior but how it's similar and different. Now I started off doing this because in terms of ethnicity, I went to Elk Island National Park and the, uh, the park warden there said, hey, we know the people who are coming here look different. The visible minority group members, but we don't know anything about them. We don't know what experiences they want here. And so this is a field trip with uh, Scott Swinerton's class. And so I got back into that area of research. The culture side was more about, so if we're looking at Chinese Canadians, for example, and Jing Yang Yang, where's Jing Yang? Jing Yang was the first PhD student I, and Guy Swinerton, co-supervised. Jing Yang said, but if you want to understand Chinese Canadians, you got to understand Chinese. You got to go to China or collect data in China. So that was part of it in terms of trying to understand the similarities and differences. And I thank you, Jing Yang, for pointing that out to me. And the other is in terms of social class. I'm not sure you can read this, but this is what's called the super creative class by a guy named Florida. This would be people like artists and professors are always interesting to look at. And you can see, for example, confidence was significantly lower in people's leisure if they were in this class and work. And we actually said, geez, what's going on with these people? Maybe they need to take a leisure education course because they don't seem to feel very confident about what they're doing in their leisure time. On the other hand, this was retail, wait staff, etc. And you can see the differences. This was the same and these were different. And so it's just an example of when we start looking at things from a psychological perspective, there's things we have to take into account. Age, gender, social class, ethnicity, culture, because you really want to understand the similarities and the differences. And sometimes we focus too much on one or the other and not both. 
just another little bit about my research. So intrinsic motivation is you do it because it's interesting and enjoyable, and you do it for its own sake. You're not getting something out of it. You're not getting healthy, for example. You're not getting money or rewards or prizes. This study with Jin Yang Dang and a, another grad student, it was 2005, we did this beautiful think piece and we sort of got quite trash self-determination theory from a cultural perspective, but we were pretty antagonistic. This is a follow-up study with the actual data that we collected from workers in China, uh, workers in Hong Kong, and workers in Canada. And the kinds of things we found is self-determination theory seems to work. In terms of this buying into something, Hong Kong, Edmonton, very similar, very strong effect. The difference comes here. In North America, it's more about confidence, potentially, where it seems to be more about belonging, that sense of connection in places like Asia. And so when we looked at this and broke it down, well, yeah, there's some consistency with self-determination theory when you look at it from a cultural perspective. But there are also some differences. And one of the things Hein, a psychologist at UBC said is, you know, here it's about being good. Where in a place like China or Japan, it's about becoming better. It's not about confidence, it's about effort and perseverance. And that seems to maybe explain some of the differences we're finding. Um, do you remember the, the Toyota commercials where they used to talk about this thing called Kaizen? Kaizen is this idea of always becoming better. And that's the kind of difference that we see cross culture. There seems to be a difference there, and that's why we look at this. So maybe more than you want to know, there's no exam, don't panic. <laughs> so that's the kind of research I've done pretty well for 22 years. But probably the highlight for me is not my research, I think I'm going to answer your question here, Marcel. <laughs> but that are my graduate students. And I've had some great, great graduate students. Just to give you an idea, so when I talk about indigenous, what we're trying to do here is we're not trying to take an idea like leisure <coughs> and trans transport it to China or Japan. What we're trying to do is say, are there words in your language that may make sense, that may inform <coughs> not only how we should look at leisure, but maybe how you look at leisure. And uh, we're talking about motivations, and we're talking about psychologically deep experiences, one of my class. And Jin Yang Deng comes up and he says, there's this word, this word in Chinese, and I'm going to mispronounce this because I pronounce all words in other languages wrong. Rumi. And so what is Rumi? And it's to enter into and become lost in. And it said, Enter into a story and you become lost in it. Or maybe a computer game. So we did a study on this. But as I tell my students, there should be an English word for this because it explains so much what happens maybe in sport, but in terms of movies and books and other things. To enter into and become lost in. And that came from Jin Yang saying, maybe we should look at this word. Now his dissertation, and again, co-chaired by Guy, Guy Swinnerton, also was very interesting and has been very well cited in terms of not only looking at leisure attitudes but environmental attitudes, especially as the populations in North America are changing. So that's Jin Yang. Eiji Ito, oh, Jin Yang, I should point out here, is an associate professor at West Virginia University. So you always nice to see people who go on in academia. Uh, Eiji Ito is a associate professor at Wakayama University in Japan. And he said, well, you know what we want to do? There's actually two words for leisure in Japanese. Rija, you say it really quick, Rija sounds like leisure, right? And yoga. So he looked at those two in Japan, and then here he looked at leisure in Canada and compared them. And essentially the leisure Penn State test. So these leisure, line, leisure, line, do this ten times and you find out maybe something about what leisure is, or leisure or yoga. Jin Yang Hui is getting close to being done. Is Howie here? Howie Gorsha? Yes, right? She's getting close to being done. Thank you. <laughs> Her co-supervisor. What she did is there's a Chinese word, 
Chief Shan. I'm looking around. Close? Close enough. Chief Shan. And so what she's done is she's looking at Chief Shan and leisure, but she says, you know, in, in Chinese culture, we often look at the yin and the yang, the dialectic. So not only should we look at Chief Shan and leisure, what is not leisure and what is not Chief Shan? And she's had some amazing results. And what we find is there are similarities and differences. This is why we look for it. Shia Wang, I saw Shia somewhere here. She is here, and Haidong Liang, Liang is up front. They looked at, you heard the term face. So we talk about losing face, for example. And I think it was, again, Jing Yang Dang talked about face, and he said, I was trying to get him to speak up more in class. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> he said, but you don't understand. If I ask you a question and you can't answer it as a professor, you lose face. And I said, I'm fine with that, I'm just doing it. <laughs> he said, but you don't understand. If I, as a Chinese person, ask you a question and you can't answer it, I lose face. Because that goes against the social norms in Chinese culture. And so these two studies, with Xia Wang on the back of the, the bike with her partner Nick, and Hai Dong, tried to look at this concept of face as a motivation and as a concern. <coughs> Tentero Kono, some of you may still remember. Um, I didn't know this, in, in his dissertation presentation, he walks in and he, he's doing his presentation and he says, you know, Dr. Walker challenged me to come up with one word for my dissertation topic. And that word that I chose was ikigai, which is a life worth living. I went, wow, I'm so smart. I don't remember that at all. <laughs> a life worth living. And so what he did is he went out and he interviewed people and had them bring in their photos and their cameras about Icky Guy. And he never mentioned leisure. Leisure emerged out of the photos they showed and the interviews that he collected. Helene's somewhere here. Helene came. <laughs> A lady came in and she said, there's, this, there's many words for happiness in Chinese, but she said, there's this one I really like. And how is it pronounced? But it means to live in ease and comfort. I love that. It's someone who's about to retire. To live in ease and comfort. And so she's going to do her research looking at this in terms of Chinese Canadian women who become empty nesters and how leisure fits in and do they how and why and when do they experience it? Maria Lin, uh, interesting one. First time I'd ever looked at Latin Americans, and so it was quite uh, interesting looking at another group and how they settled into Canada. Um, Latin American Canadians are one of the, I think, top five fastest growing groups in this country. And we know this much of it. Nancy Yan is, I hope, here. And she's going to look how savoring, in terms of one's travel experiences, may contribute to people's well-being. Almost done. I have this real interest in nature-based leisure. Maybe because of that forestry background. Maybe because, as the dean said, I like to spend as much time in a canoe out in the wilderness as possible. Um, Andrew was looking at this in terms of how do people react, you know, when you're on a trail and you're hiking, and suddenly that horse goes by and craps in front of you. <laughs> when a mountain bike goes speeding by, and he's looking at this in terms of affective reactions. Uh, Fenton was looking at psychologically deep experiences in leisure, like spiritual experiences at communitas when people come together or flow. And Jane Hurley, I think it's over here, uh, I supervised her master's degree. She did her master's degree at Royal Roads. And she was looking at refugees in terms of their nature-based leisure, and how it might help in terms of their quality of life. So, again, you know, the joy is a professor is working with great graduate students to come in and say, I think this is worth doing. And what you're trying to do is to help them as much as possible. Let them run. Sometimes you have to pull them back. Sometimes they get lost. But man, when they run, there is no joy like supervising a student like that. The last part of my research. 
I don't know, I, I think I've written around a little under 100 papers. But what I really loved doing was taking those ideas and pulling them together. Um, you can see this book I was one of the, the co-editors on. The Leisure Matters was kind of a labor of love. Um, Tim Burton, who actually hired me, and Ed Jackson, who was an adjunct out of geography, had done some of these, these foundational books in 1989 and 1999 on leisure. And so I was <coughs> kind of following them. And the last one, The Social Psycho Leisure, um, this one came out, as it says, 2019. I got to use it in my last class, <laughs> the third edition. It took like five years to get this thing done, so I'm waiting for the USRI. So let's hope it's good. But <laughs> so those are the books. And I was able to pull things together. Uh, I should just point out, I think in every case, my co-authors, my co-editors, the idea came out of dinner at a conference. Tom was talking about conferences. So sometimes you go for a conference just to hang out and have dinner and maybe drink or two and talk about books. And so that's where these ideas came from. Kind of leisure. So 40, 40, 20, here's the question. <laughs> just ask it. <laughs> all right. Deja vu all over again. 2015, the President's Visiting Committee came. And this is one of the recommendations that they made. How to increase research productivity while maintaining smaller areas that are not research intensive. Now, if you're at a research intensive university and somebody calls out your area is not research intensive, as Brian Mirage says, it's like winning the, uh, winning the teacher, best teacher of the year award at MIT. It's the kiss of death. Well, maybe not. This hurt because we didn't think it was accurate. And is there other than this part here, not only not research intensive, but some stakeholders thought it was essential, but apparently maybe it was a, a dynamic committee. Yeah, <laughs> we'll go with that. Well, Dean Bummery took a look at it and went, well, this doesn't seem to jive with my opinion of what's going on in recreation. And so he looked at the research. Second in Canada, uh, eighth in North America, fifth worldwide. I just looked at the data like 20 minutes before I came here and said, oh man, I hope this is still good. Uh, still <laughs> fifth worldwide. And I love this statement. The faculty would like to correct perceptions. And again, this is that, I hate to say it, looking over your shoulder and then, you know, it hurt. Because we thought we were better than that. And we had to convince people. Now, the next slide will say something like, ah, thank you, Carrie. I appreciate what you did. <laughs> Carrie mentioned about going canoeing. And this is him. <laughs> and this is Chris in the front. And this is the Moline Lake where we went canoeing for four or five days. And I just want to say, and this is high praise for me, Carrie is an OK canoeist. <laughs> <laughs> Tom says, though, that Chris was doing all the work on the front. <laughs> so, talk to Tom. Oh, uh, that was one shout out to our dean. I got a couple more, and we'll still get to the cash bar, I promise. <laughs> Lori Eisner, when you do this thing where new faculty come in and we all get together and we all give a little bit of advice, and I say, do your leisure, and she says, have friends outside the faculty. I don't know if Lori's here or not. And it's true. You gotta have friends outside the faculty. I do, we do. But, you know, there's other people that have been really great friends. And like Tom, I don't think I could identify them all. Tom won't. <laughs> Liz, Howie, some of the recreation people, some of the people I have coffee with, the 10 o'clock coffee group, like Brian Seving and Dan Mason. Um, I figured one time I went through the 40 faculty members, and I've had, I think, dinner with at least 20 of them. Aggressive dinners from Brian Mirage's to our place to uh, Jane Valentine's place or at other places. So, or maybe it was at a conference or wherever, Billy, but I'm sure I did. <laughs> but there are some specific ones I want to thank. Guy and Tom were on my search committee. Brian and I met on the racquetball courts. Uh, I think that's everybody up there. We've gotten together, I think, for 20 years. We've had Christmas at the Swinnertons, which is amazing. 
We've done that. We've had lobster fest at the Hinches just about every year that we're in the country. We've had Ode to the Sausage at Brian Nielsen, <laughs> where we tried out a, a large variety of sausages and big old people, I hate to say it this way, we erroneously called it Sausage Fest. <laughs> we owe it to the Hinch's Daughters. <laughs> well, that ain't a good fit. <laughs> I want to thank you, because you have been like our Edmontonian family. So, thank you. Oh, Breakfast Club. So you can see Gord Bell over there. Gord Bell was, Gord Bell was, Gord Bell was a hero, right? I can say this, he was my hero. Uh -huh. He was like the ultimate 40-40-20. And he had organized these, these coffees like once a month where we got together and had a coffee and just talked. And you can see, uh, who else is back there? Uh, Romeo, who you may remember, uh, Gary Grindy is there, and this is me with hair. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Woo! <laughs> That's my niece. <laughs> the KGB, so this is Gary Grindy, me, and Brad Mirage. Uh, we've been getting together Monday, Wednesday, and Friday probably 45 weeks of the year for 20 years for coffee. To talk, to talk about sports, to talk about our families, to talk about our careers, everything. I, I bought Tim Hortons uh, stock a long time ago. <laughs> and I'll just say this, uh, I'm gonna recognize them in particular because when you have coffee with a Rutherford <laughs> winner for excellence in undergrad teaching, and you have one of the best top researchers in the country, you gotta learn something. And I'm sure the camera's over here. I'm gonna say, Kerry mm -hmm. Kearney is picking up with the Manulife Prize in Montreal, probably one of the, the top prizes in health. And so I'm just gonna say, hey Kerry, well done. Congratulations, <laughs> man. You deserve it. There's a, there's a word in Dutch. There's two words in Dutch. What is the way you traditionally think about envy, that kind of dark? emotion that we don't like when we do it, but it's pretty natural. And the other one is like upward social comparison. It means you look up at somebody and go, I'd like to be more like them. And when it comes to teaching and when it came to research, these are the two people I look at because they have taught me so much. So I'd like to thank them. Uh, this is, we get together every year between uh, the end of June and the first week of July, play bocce across the quad and enter the faculty club because their birthdays are on each end of that. And we've done that for about 20 years as well. I'm almost done here, I promise. This is my brother. This is in his Navy dress uniform. And this is what I wrote about him. Um, uh, keep it together, Dory. Uh, my mom graduated. She convocated in grade 8. And then a family was poor, so she went out and worked. My father graduated, well, he didn't graduate. He left school in grade five, because the family was poor and he went out to work. And so when my brother decided that he wanted to go to university, there was 200 bucks in his bank account, and there was no way that was paying for anything. So he did what poor kids do. He joined the military. Spent 20 years in the military. The first year he went off, and probably because he was in the military, a different culture, very much, much like academia is a different culture, a different world. He struggled. He told me he almost failed. He had to take a bunch of courses over, but he pushed through. He got his degree. He continued in the military, as I said, for 20 years. He got his master's degree at Queen's, which I hear is a good university, and then his PhD there. And so as I say, he made my, my decision to come to university easier, to stay in university pursue a PhD. Um, he passed away in December, and I'm lucky because his daughter, Kim, is in the front row. <coughs> so, he made it easier, but it wasn't easy. I, uh, Bob was off, he was doing his master's and PhD at Queen's, and I, um, I left Moose Shaw, I was a uh, 17 years old, I went off to the University of Saskatchewan, and I, I was looking for wisdom when I went to university. I had no idea what I wanted to do, like a lot of people. I was just looking for wisdom. And um, 
Well, I could say a couple things about wisdom. One is uh, you don't always find it at university, so I'll come back to that. But the other thing is uh, I was offered what's called a dean's vacation. <laughs> Everybody know what that is? If not, look it up in the Urban Dictionary. I was offered a dean's vacation. I remember going home to my parents, who again had to go to high school. And I said, I got a dean's vacation. And my mom said, is that like a scholarship? <laughs> <laughs> you? <laughs> so the next thing I did for pretty well the next 10 years, when I wasn't likely to be traveling and wasn't, I wasn't lucky enough to marry Janet, is in the summer, I rode in one of these at a park, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. By Friday, I was at the other end of the park, and I come back on Monday and start over. Just about drove me nuts. And in the winter, well, my Zamboni wasn't this nice. <laughs> and Howie Horshaw said, you, you live the Canadian dream, driving a Zamboni. <laughs> yeah, five times a day, five days a week, that's 25. Four weeks a month, that's 100 times. And by the end of the season, 600 times I've gone around that stupid ring. And it just about drove me nuts. And I came home and said, Dan, I can't do this. And she said, time to go back to school. Seriously, this time, right? <laughs> That's when I went back. I went back to get my bachelor's degree at Regina. And then I continued on. And I got a job as a recreation programmer. And then you know the rest of the story. No, two things. I found wisdom at Virginia Tech. I'm walking down a hall, School of Forestry. There's a nameplate, Dr. Hallie Wisdom. <laughs> Seriously, I went up to this door and I said, I finally found wisdom. And he looked at me like I was a stalker. I didn't think it was funny. The other thing I came across was this book. It came out in 1995. And so I'm finishing up my PhD and going off to be an academic, I hope. It's called This Fine Place So Far From Home Voices of Academics from the Working Class. And there's been a number of books that have come out since this, but I like this one. I've read it multiple times. I've given it to students who are working class that are going off, who are trying to figure out academia. And I'll just put up two quotes here. I like academics as a group. Uh, this is, uh, I think, Connie Lopagia. I like academics as a group. They're smart, funny, witty, and reasonable. But I still think of them as them. <laughs> Although I have graduate degrees and been on college faculty for decades, my upbringing did not equip me to be polite. I'm too loud, I use the wrong words, and I speak my voice. And I may have done that occasionally. On the other hand, you can see I've added a couple of adjectives. This place is far, far away from where I started. This place where I am is a fine, fine place. I feel extraordinarily privileged to have got back in. The conditions here are amazing. I try not to take them for granted. A proletarian background gives one perspective on things. I used to, and I stopped doing this because people didn't like it, say, wow, we are so overpaid as faculty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just joking around. <laughs> oh, last thing. Um, to my wife, Janet. This is also for my dissertation. I'm not that good at acknowledgments, apparently. <laughs> Without your love, care, support, and understanding, there would be no need to make any other acknowledgments. Thank you for making all things not only possible, but joyful. Not a bad life. <laughs> so, I asked Brian Neal something because he's given the last lecture, what, five years ago, and you're still here? <laughs> he said, big ending, strong ending, and I'm not sure if this is it, but I want to try. So I've gone to oh, probably nearly 100 faculty councils, and I don't know how many academic councils, and some of them have been a little less than spectacular, and other ones have been profound. And who can ever forget the famous Oxford comma discussion? Should it be kinesiology, sport, and recreation, or should it be kinesiology, comma, sport, comma, and recreation? Yes. 
No! Jeez. So one of the things that always stuck out with me was, if you remember after the Fort McMurray fires, the faculty had done some amazing things, putting on programs and services for those people that were staying in the dorms and, and doing other things. And Cheryl, the director of campus and community recreation, she was summarizing what we had done as a faculty. Do you remember what she said? Oh, I guess that's better, better for me than her. We get shit done. <laughs> I had a chance to talk to her at the ARPA conference last year when she was there. We were sharing a table. And I said, man, I love that. We get shit done. And I said, I thought it applied to recreation practitioners because of what they do in terms of you know, making things happen in programs and services and volunteers and playgrounds and trifecta, rinks and everything else. Recreation practice is where I came from. I think that's a pretty good summary, but I'd like to think that maybe it applies also to, I'm gonna say myself and Tom. I can see Tom cringing up here, but that's okay. We got, we too got shit done. <laughs> The end is here. So thank you very much. That's it! <laughs>